OK, good morning, uh, everybody. We'll get started. Uh, uh, this morning we have uh, Dr. Simon Hansom presenting. Um, uh, Dr. Hansom is well known to all of us. Uh, he did most of his training in, in, in England and then came to join us uh, and did two years of uh, EP with us and then was uh, headhunted to be go on staff in Kingston and then we managed to headhunt him back which we were delighted to do and he started back on staff in September 2021 and he's assumed uh, taken over from Dr Green as the director of Inherited Arrhythmia Clinic. Dr Green's been done a wonderful job for, for many years but uh, has now passed it to Dr Hansom and uh, Dr Hansom's going to talk about arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy which is one of the the, the, one of the four or five conditions that they look after in the Inherited Arrhythmic Clinic. Good morning, Dr. Hansom. Thanks so much, Dr. Bernie. Uh, thank you for the introduction. It's great to be here. Uh, it's nice to be back in Fistinalis, and I'm, I have to say, really grateful for the uh, six people who turned up because I was slightly worried <laughs> I was going to be standing in front of an empty room. Um, hopefully, this will be a, an interesting presentation for all of you. And it's a, it's a common condition that we're all going to see at some stage, and particularly for the residents. Um, there's lots to learn. So I don't have any disclosures uh, of note. So just as an outline for you, we'll have a look at some uh, background to ARVC and in particular terminology, um, because that's been changing over the last few years. We'll look at the genetics, the molecular basis for ARVC, and we'll focus a little bit more on the natural history and progression. We'll look at the diagnosis because there are some particular challenges there and some pitfalls as well. And then we'll look at the approaches to management following. We've got a clinical case in the middle. We'll look at risk stratification, uh, ICDs and some cascade screening, uh, and then we'll draw some conclusions at the end. So you might wonder, what's the tedious link? Why have I just shown you a picture of the Simpsons? And actually, there is no tedious link. The reason it's there is because they're a family and inherited arrhythmia, ARVC as an inherited arrhythmia condition affects families. And we'll talk about this a little bit later on, but you can imagine the consequence of one of these five having a form of inherited arrhythmia. For example, you know, Marge, imagine she gets diagnosed with ARVC. What's the implications for her kids? What's the implications for the family? Does she survive the sudden cardiac arrest? What's the implications for her parents who may have passed that gene on to her? And these are the things that we often think about in the inherited arrhythmia clinic because ultimately it's about the patient and the patient that's in front of you. And we should never really forget that. So arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, uh, as we know, is characterized by this fibro fatty infiltration. And we see a, a predisposition towards ventricular arrhythmia. And one of the key features that I would stress to residents is that where you see a disproportionate amount of ventricular arrhythmia based on the substrate, then that's where we have to be really suspicious. We've known for some time now that the so-called desmosomal proteins and the desmosomal genes that code for them often are implicated in these cases. And the prevalence is always a little bit hard to know for sure, but it's somewhere between one in 2,000 and one in 5,000. There's definite geographical variation, and particularly if you go to Italy, in some parts of Italy, the prevalence is significantly higher than that. But we usually see that most people present between 20 and 40 years of age. It's very, very rare before adolescence, and we'll talk about the implications for that for screening later on, but it's very unusual to see this present before then. And you can imagine the spectrum of symptoms. I have to say most people do not have any before their first event, and that can be really challenging for the family uh, and very challenging for us to try and predict who is at high risk. So anything from palpitations through to clear over syncope and then ultimately the potential for sudden cardiac death. And if you look at unexplained cardiac deaths, it probably accounts for about 10% um, of cardiac arrests and about 4% of sudden cardiac death. Terminology has been interesting, and certainly within the inherited arrhythmia community over the last few years, we've tried to move away from the term ARVC. And that's because as our understandings evolved, we know that in a lot of cases, it's not isolated to the right ventricle. We know that probably in about 50% of cases we see involvement of the left ventricle as well. And therefore the terminology becomes a little bit challenging and misleading in some ways. What we've done essentially is to step back and have a look and come up with this term where you remove the word right. So you have arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. But by doing that, really they threw open 
the door to a very broad spectrum of conditions. Where we see this disproportionate balance of ventricular arrhythmia based on the degree of LV dysfunction, but that now includes a number of different conditions, which are some of them are systemic diseases, infectious diseases, inflammatory disorders, and isolated ion channel diseases. And if we look at the breakdown here, so in the middle um, is a nice diagram, but the desmosomal gene mutations probably make up about half of the ones that we would see. Uh, and of those, there are uh, five key desmosomes um, that we know. So um, uh, junctional placoglobin, desmocholine, desmoglein, those two are certainly more common within the UK and Europe, uh, desmoplakin, and then placophilin, the PKP2 mutation, uh, is the dominant form that we see in North America. It makes for about 60% of cases. But really, that's only half of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. The other half is made up of various other things that we know of. So, um, TMEM43, we'll talk about later, is founder mutation. Uh, phospholamban is the Dutch equivalent of a founder mutation for arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. But we see here as well, so particularly for Dr. Burney, we see uh, cardiac sarcoidosis is included under inflammatory. There's other forms of neuromuscular disease uh, as well. From the point of view of arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, this is a diagram which, having now looked at it on the screen, is uh, relatively small, so apologies for that. But really, the, the focus for a long time has been on what's called the intercalated disc. And the intercalated disc is made up of various proteins here, but the key are the cadherin uh, proteins that span the membrane and are bound to these other desmosomal proteins that link the cytoskeleton. So you imagine another cell above here with its cadherins bound to this cells, and they're linked by all of this cytoskeleton. And it's really a key network the indicated disc that binds cells together, but it also has a role in cellular signaling. So we see disorder not only in cell-to-cell -cell adhesion, but we see disorder in cell-to-cell -cell signaling. Um, and that's one of the key principles as to the risk of uh, arrhythmia as well. If you look down here at the nuclear uh, membrane, you see TMM43 and lamin uh, AC as well. So TMM43 is uh, worth uh, focusing on. So um, uh, Sean Connors has done a, a huge amount of work on this. And it's very impressive how well they've traced this mutation back. So this is the S358L mutation, which they found in about 24 Canadian families. But when you cascade that out as a pedigree, they've identified about 1,200 individuals. Uh, it's probably gone up now. Um, but they actually managed to trace it back to a single founder pair from 1799 and 1800, which is really impressive work. The key issue with team m43 and you'll see some of them come through here often for transplantation is that it actually demonstrates complete penetrance and whereas in most cases of arvc we see very variable penetrance very variable expressivity team m is aggressive and we see complete penetrance but there are some interesting features within it so particularly in men you see that they have a, a significant burden of arrhythmia at young ages often they die of arrhythmic events early on whereas women seem to do better from the point of view of arrhythmia and they survive to later life, but they then ultimately die because of heart failure issues. Recently, people have been proposing, you know, you'd imagine that, that uh, ARVC goes through a natural um, uh, evolution. The question is what's happening at the beginning? That's the challenge, you know, what's happening during that concealed phase. So before you see any of the classical ECG changes, any of the classical structure changes on imaging, what's happening then? Because we still know that those patients, albeit small, have an increased risk of sudden cardiac death. So they've been doing some work with uh, PKP2 knockout mice, having a look, and they've definitely found that there's disordered, disordered calcium signaling between adjacent cells. And, and they've actually seen ventricular fibrillation within those um, within those mice. As the condition progresses, that's where we start to see the classical features that we all know. So you start to see the precordial T wave inversion, the appearance of the epsilon wave, PVCs, non-sustained VT, and then sustained VT. And as you get this progressive fibro fatty replacement of the myocardium, you can imagine that the substrate for ventricular arrhythmia starts to increase and you start to see more monomorphic VT, whereas probably in the early concealed phase, the sudden cardiac deaths are mostly related to ventricular fibrillation rather than VT, because there's no true circuit there at that stage. As the disease then progresses, that certainly in the purest form with the ARVC, you see progressive right-sided heart failure, but we know also that the left side in a lot of cases becomes involved. <laughs> 
This was um, some interesting work from uh, Elijah Bear's group in the UK. So um, they have a, a national pathology centre that's based in London, and they looked at 5,000 cases, so good on them, but 5,000 cases that came through as unexplained death. Uh, and of those, they took about 202 that they felt were related to arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. And it's just worth pointing out some of the features, and some of these will be aware of, but look at the young age. These are, on average, 32 years old. Uh, most of them are male. They've got lean body weights. These are fit individuals. Most of them did not have any preceding symptoms. Only 10% of them had any form of syncope before their sudden death. Um, so the vast majority were entirely asymptomatic. What was also interesting was that, depending on how rigorous you are with your post-mortem examination, things can be missed. From a macroscopic point of view, 20, 22% of them had a normal appearance to the heart. But when they sectioned and looked microscopically, that's where they saw uh, more significant change. And again here, we see that there's biventricular disease in actually a significant proportion. So just remember, this isn't pure ARVC. This is arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy as a whole. And so we expect to see more left side involvement as opposed to the pure right side we may see in ARVC. So from a resident point of view, what do you look for? Who are these people who you want to kind of be on your radar as higher risk uh, individuals? So certainly people who have events during exercise are the ones that we get most suspicious by. So exercise related palpitations and particularly those people who are syncopal during exercise. There are other arguments as to why you can be syncopal following exercise, but during exercise, that's a particular concern. Survivors of sudden cardiac death, that's pretty straightforward. Um, Patients who have increased burden of ventricular ectopy um, and VT with a left bundle morphology are the other the other ones you want to be uh, careful not to miss. And this can be challenging as well, particularly with an EP. We know that if you look at the idiopathic PVCs, the RV, uh, RV outflow tract is one of the commonest places for them. And trying to distinguish someone who may have an early form of uh, ARVC from someone who just has an idiopathic process can be a challenge. So diagnosis uh, is based on the 2010 task force criteria, and this acknowledges the fact that there is no single one test that's going to give you the diagnosis. And so the task force criteria essentially brings together information from various different sources. We look at structure and function based on uh, echo and MRI. Previously, we've looked a lot with tissue characterization with biopsy. We don't do biopsy as much now uh, unless there's really diagnostic uncertainty. We look at both depolarization and repolarization abnormalities. Uh, we look at the burden of arrhythmia and we look at the family history. And essentially, you have to have two major criteria, one major, two minor or four minor, in order to give yourself a definitive diagnosis. The specificity is good, over 90%, but the differential diagnosis has always got to be borne in mind. And for me particularly, and I think for most people, the, the two big challenges are, as I've just said to you, idiopathic PVCs, but also the athletic heart. We'll talk about that in a few moments time, but there's a significant overlap in how they can uh, appear uh, on it on investigation. And there are many people who end up with ICDs who have athletic hearts who don't have any increased risk of sudden cardiac death. So. Athletic heart wise, one of the challenges, particularly with endurance athletes, is that we know that remodeling of the RV can mimic ARVC and uh, the uh, increased burden of ectopy, particularly from the outflow tract, can in some cases fulfill the major criteria in about 25% of, of those patients. Dr. Gerling, can you shut the door? So definitely, we're just trying the door, it's quite noisy in here. So a dilatation of the IBOT can fulfill major criteria, um, but half of them can fulfill minor criteria. Uh, the T wave changes can be quite significant as well in some athletes, and so that can also mimic things. So there is a potential that you could fulfill a definite diagnosis of ARVC on somebody who otherwise is healthy. So there's been a lot of work on this, and Bob Hamilton at Sick Kids um, has kind of led the way. So it's, you know, Canada really is at the forefront of uh, research in arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. So he um, proposed that actually antibodies to desmoglein 2 could help you to differentiate from people who have ARVC versus an athletic heart. And he proposed that uh, with the underlying genetic mutation in desmoglein, that it may expose some neural epitopes to the immune system and you develop antibodies to them. And what was fascinating was that when you looked at patients who had a clinical ARVC, 
The presence of the antibody appeared to be 100% sensitive in both adults and in children. And the specificity in, uh, in normal controls was also very high at 97%. When they looked at 30 endurance athletes who had RV dilatation, the specificity remained at 100%. So this is an ongoing area of work, but if, if it pans out, it's actually going to be a very novel, clever way for us to distinguish somebody who has an athletic heart versus ARVC. What are the ECG features? So um, here's a 12 lead for you, and you see here the typical precordial T wave inversion. And if you look up in V1, there's a couple of other things just to draw your eye to. One is that you see this slurring in the terminal portion of the S wave, but also in the ST segment, you see this very low amplitude fractionation, which essentially would become a, an epsilon wave. And these obviously are, are, are key features of ARVC. So if we zoom in here, um, this is what's called the uh, terminal activation duration. I have to say, we don't use it very much. It's interesting if you see slowing in that terminal part of the S wave, but for most of us to be able to measure 55 milliseconds on a 12 lead ECG is pretty hard. Um, and so outside of research, it's not really something that's done too much, but the principle that this reflects underlying slowing of conduction in the RV is really what's key. So here's a clinical case. So um, this is someone who I've followed for the last five years, um, and she's a, a very interesting uh, individual. I'm not sure why that hasn't advanced. Okay, it's advanced on my screen, not on your screen. There we go. So this is a 16 year old uh, lady. Uh, she had a completely normal childhood and the key was uh, she came from a very competitive family. Her dad was in the military. He was a triathlete. The mother was a triathlete as well. They were training at a very high competitive level from about 13 years onwards um, and were super motivated to be exercising. So during a, a swimming tournament, which actually was a televised event, uh, she became unresponsive, was pulled from the water, CPR was commenced, and thankfully there was an AED there. Uh, the initial rhythm was VT, and then she ultimately degraded to VF, and then she was shocked, and they got ROSC. And she was in CHEO for about eight weeks, had various uh, difficulties, but was ultimately uh, called and, and did very well uh, from a neuro neurological perspective. And she underwent pretty comprehensive workup and genetic testing. And this was her VCG when she, when she was in the intensive care unit. And really there's not much there. You know, there's T wave inversion V1, V2, but there's not really anything else on that ECG that would make you suspicious. We're obviously thinking, you know, down, down the road of this is ARVC, but even if you had this ECG come before you in someone who's had an out of hospital cardiac arrest, there's not really anything else on that ECG that would draw your eye or make you suspicious as to an alternative etiology. So she gets one investigated, and this is her echo while she was actually in intensive care. So, you know, the RV was mildly dilated and mildly impaired, but ultimately the MRI was uh, really helpful here. So not only did she have RV microaneurysms, the RV function was impaired at 38% with an RV apical aneurysm as well. The LV looked clear at that stage and she had no GAD. The signal average DCG. So this is a way of building up these small fractionated potentials where essentially you run a 12 lead again and again and again over the top and it builds up and amplifies those very small fractionated potentials and hers was significantly abnormal. The Holter monitor showed over a thousand PVCs with two distinct morphologies and ultimately she was diagnosed with ARVC. She had genetic testing done and she was shown to have the most common uh, mutation, which is a placophilin PKP2 mutation. So again, we come back to the Simpson family and we talk about, you know, what's the impact now for this family? So um, if this was Lisa, who's just been diagnosed with ARVC, what's the implication for, for Bart and his sister? What's the implication for the parents? Because ultimately, when this situation happens, they're the ones that we need to see as well. So. Not only does the, the probe and the person with the condition come through to the inherited arrhythmia clinic, but we cascade screen out to the first degree relatives as well. We're just going to spend a bit of time talking about that process. Cascade screening within Ontario can come from two different places. Now, Ontario probably within the whole of Canada is leading the way in referrals that come through to us from uh, post-mortem studies. 
So if you have a post-mortem in Ontario and no definitive cause is identified or there are clear features of a form of inherited arrhythmia, a disease, ARVC, then immediately a letter is initiated that cascade screens, goes to the family members and says, please take this letter to your family doctor uh, and we recommend that you're referred to the inherited arrhythmia clinic. So that's good for us because it makes us feel more confident that we're not missing families within Ontario. The other place that the cascade screening comes from is other physicians and from us within within uh, Ottawa. Um, so when we see the pro band, we then take a very clear family history and we send out these letters to the family members to try and get as many of them to come forward as we can. Um, the ultimate assessment that we do has to be really comprehensive. So we usually have a, a cardiologist who has an expertise in inherited arrhythmia. Uh, and would pair that with a genetics counsellor. And the genetic counsellor is a fantastic resource because, number one, they have an understanding of the genetics. Number two, they're a counsellor. These are bereaved families. The majority of people that we see in this case have either survived a sudden cardiac arrest or they've died, and we see the family members who are left. So having a counsellor within that, that uh, clinic is a fantastic resource. We look at them comprehensively, ECG, signal average ECG, Holter, we treadmill them, we do the transthoracic echo and in some situations the MRI as well. We take a full history, our particular focus is on uh, palpitations, uh, syncope and also how much exercise they do because th this case that I showed you is not unique. We know that exercise, the amount of exercise that an individual does changes not only the age at which they present, but also the severity at which they present with the condition when it comes through. And we'll, we'll talk about that a bit later on. We do a three generation family history and we discuss with them the role of genetic testing. Now that can be a challenge for some families because we know that generally the chance of us getting a genetic hit in these sorts of cases is about 50 to 60 percent at best. And so we have to accept this kind of grey zone that we offer them genetic testing, but we may not get a positive result that we can use to then screen other family members. And that can be uh, another particular challenge because you end up following all these other family members uh, for a long period of time to see if they ever manifest uh, features of the disease. Whereas if you have a clear gene that you can follow, in some cases we can discharge, but in some cases. And these were just some of the challenges that I that I jot, jotted down when I was thinking about it. And, you know, the, the psychosocial aspect of the clinic is important and how we manage the patients is important. And one of the particular challenges is that often because of the ages at which these conditions strike with adolescents, you know, teenagers, young adults, these are high risk kind of individuals, high risk behaviours, they're geographically mobile, it can be very hard to, to keep a track on them and keep them in follow up with us. But it's also trying to deal with the uncertainty of the diagnosis, deal with the uncertainty of what it means for them, but dealing with the guilt in the family as well. You know, in most cases in ARVC, there is a mutation that's passed through the family. And when you sit there with the family and you say, this is an inherited condition, and you talk about screening, you see the change in the parents' face because they know that it's come through one of them in most cases. And that's and that's really tough. And so you have to approach that in a very delicate way. Um, follow up, uh, we see them in clinic uh, obviously very regularly uh, with a key emphasis being on reduction in mortality, both from an arrhythmic point of view and from a heart failure perspective. And we try and slow disease progression as best we can. And really the main focus for that, the, the best focus is on exercise and trying to restrict their exercise. We try and reduce their palpitation burden and improve their quality of life. Um, and in particular, we have to be very careful with ICDs and we'll talk about that again in a few slides time. Therapeutic options, well, obviously pharmacological treatment. Now, pharmacological treatment in ARVC, none of the antiarrhythmics that we use have been shown to reduce the risk of life-threatening arrhythmia. They can reduce the burden of slower VTs, they can improve symptoms, but they don't seem to change sudden death outcome. Um, ICDs are, are key as risk stratification is vital. Catheter ablation, we've grown in our experience with that, and that's an important uh, adjunct as well. And then ultimately heart transplantation. And then during their repeated reviews, we look at them again uh, with ECGs and halters. Uh, we follow them sequentially with ECHO and we repeatedly exercise test them, often when they're on beta blockers, um, to see how they behave. 
risk stratification for an ICD is probably the single most important thing when you see a patient in clinic. When you have someone like that who presents with an arrest, it's not a difficult decision. They're very easy. But one of the challenges that we have in the clinic is that given the variable penetrance and expressivity of the disease, what do you do with a family member who you find that is genotype positive and has very mild disease? How on earth do you risk stratify that person? They've seen someone in the family who's had a aborted, you know, sudden cardiac uh, arrest, sudden cardiac death, and that causes a lot of anxiety. And there can be this kind of knee-jerk reaction to they all need an ICD. And certainly, if you went back 20 years, that was probably what a lot of people did. But we know that isn't without its own risks. Okay. Rates of inappropriate shocks in these individuals is just under 5% per year in some studies. And these are teenagers or young adults that, and they're distressing things to experience. So although you put an ICD in the patient, you go home and you feel a little bit happier at night time because they're not going to suddenly drop dead. The impact on them can still be very significant. The ICD related complications, so this is in addition to the risk of inappropriate therapy. So things like uh, device related infection, lead fracture needing a replacement, those sorts of issues. And there is an associated yearly mortality rate with an ICD as well. So one of the focuses has to be that not only do we protect those that need the device by giving it to them, but we protect those that don't need the device um, or at least defer it for a few years until ultimately they do. And family screening, as we were saying before, has made that more challenging. So this was some work uh, from Mazanti, which was uh, from Silver Priori's group, and they looked at 267 patients with um, task force criteria ARVC, and they followed them up over six years. And they looked at the time to uh, their, uh, their first life-threatening arrhythmic event. And this was really interesting, because actually this is the first arrhythmic event, but it spans the whole way through from adolescence up to the eighth decade. This isn't something that just occurs in super young patients, it goes the whole way through. For sure, the, 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 the peak is between 20 and 40 years of age, but it's just important that we kind of understand that it's not just something that's seen in childhood. The parents, the, the grandparents can still in some situations be at risk. And when you look at the uh, the survival from cardiovascular death, we see this is a little bit more linear. And these little asterisks are people who have died uh, of heart failure. But again, it spans the whole way through. So how do we improve risk stratification? Well, we've tried many times and um, most of it was based on consensus documents. And the big focus really was on the 2015 consensus statement. And at that time, there was a growing uh, body of literature just suggesting some predictors that may suggest higher risk in these individuals. And these were expert opinion based on that evolving knowledge to try and risk stratify people in a, in, in a different way. So we're not going to spend too long on this slide, but the class one indications were largely equal across uh, the board. So people who had a cardiac arrest, people who had sustained VT, or people who had significant LV, RV impairment. That was pretty straightforward. That's your class one. Your class three, that's pretty straightforward. One of the challenges really was in this moderate group. And we see this emergence of minor risk factors, minor majors, that sort of thing. And this was what really was, was being seen in the literature. So this understanding that male gender, um, uh, the presence of um, higher burdens of uh, PVCs, for example, were suggesting these were higher risk creatures. And, uh, on that basis, this was some work from Cynthia James's group uh, at John Hopkins, and they looked to see what the performance uh, of the, the task force um, uh, criteria were here. And they took 265 patients. Now, on the basis of the ITFC um, um, uh, document, they felt that high risk individuals were those people that had an arrhythmic risk of over 10% per year. The intermediates were one to 10 and the low risk were less than 1% uh, risk per annum. But when you actually follow these patients through and you looked at their true arrhythmic risk, it was hugely off. You know, actually in the high risk individuals, their incidence of VTV FEU was nearly 30%. And they also looked at uh, VF and ventricular flutter because these were the arrhythmias which really were felt to be more akin to sudden cardiac death. And if you've got someone with VT with a rate of 110, you don't necessarily expect them to, to, to drop dead with that. But if you've got someone with ventricular flutter or fibrillation, that would be certainly something that could be akin to um, sudden cardiac death. The challenge really, though, again, was in this group. It was in the intermediate risk group. Because if you look here, although it was able to relatively clearly split between the four groups, 
the risk of VF and uh, ventricular flutter within this intermediate group was actually high, and it was equivalent to those in the highest risk group. So it just suggested it didn't necessarily work well between these two groups. So Cynthia James had a, a very clever idea, and she looked at other ways that they could try and stratify in that group. So they looked at PVC burden. And what was really interesting is if you look at these, uh, the solid black dots, that's the original classification. And although, you know, between each group, it looks like they're largely, uh, largely distinct. When you add in PVC burden, you see a very interesting change. So in this intermediate group, which was the one we just focused on, those with a PVC burden of over a thousand a day essentially move themselves up and to a similar risk as those in the high risk class one indication. And those had a low burden actually move themselves down to the very low risk group. And it seemed that PVC burden was a good way, a good additional way in that group of risk stratifying individuals. But the real key came in 2019. Uh, and again, this was work within Canada. Uh, Julia Kajran Tornigi is over in Montreal. And she kind of broke the mold in a way. This is something we've been looking for for a long period of time. And it was a way to try and risk stratify on a more individualized basis. So in 2019, they made the first uh, risk calculator for any form of uh, ventricular arrhythmia. And then two years later in 2021, they then developed one for sudden cardiac death. So it's a, it's a, a great exercise in international um, uh, um, um, working and a collaborative approach. So they used five uh, registries from around the world. All the patients had a, a background history of definitive ARVC, but with no prior history of ventricular arrhythmia. And 64% of them were genotype positive. And they looked at the, uh, the primary outcome was the, uh, the first sustained ventricular arrhythmia. Most of the mutations, um, as we see in North America, were PKP2. So it's certainly applicable to the population that we serve. And they performed univariable, multivariable uh, analysis. They ended up with these predictors. And these are, you know, if we look, think back to the 2015 um, document, we, we see here that there are similar things. Again, male gender, PVC uh, counts, cardiac syncope now, non-sustained VT, and the degree of T wave uh, change uh, on the ECG. Interestingly, LV didn't make it through, LV uh, dysfunction, but RV dysfunction did. And when you look at the survival free from the first sustained ventricular arrhythmia, we see that at five years, the uh, VA free survival probability is about, uh, was 74%. And when we uh, look on the right and look at the calibration plot, plot, we see actually that the model seemed to predict very well these events when we look at the predicted versus the observed. So the dashed line is, you know, perfect prediction, if you like, and their model seemed to work very well indeed. And the overall C statistic was 0.77. This, they made it in a similar way to the ESC hypertrophic risk score, um, but it's slightly different. This does not give you a nudge to say, oh, the risk is 8%, you should definitely consider an ICD. All it was ever intended to do was to give you an estimate of five-year five -year risk. And the idea with that was that you could sit and make an individualized decision with your patient as to whether that would justify an ICD, acknowledging the fact that that decision is very variable between individuals. When they used the, the task force criteria and they applied the rule of who were the, those highest risk individuals, they basically looked to see uh, how many patients they could protect. So if they applied those criteria, they would protect 89% of people. What they then did was that they applied uh, their risk calculator based on a various uh, different number of thresholds. And what they found was that if they looked to protect the same amount of people as the task force criteria, so 89.9% .9 of people, look at the significant reduction in the number of ICDs they had to put in to do that. So they dropped from 355 down to 282. You protect exactly the same number of people, but you're giving far fewer people an ICD. And when they looked at this, again, across various risk thresholds for ICD treatment, their model outperformed everything else, which was fantastic. That's what we want to see. So we're avoiding giving an ICD to somebody who probably doesn't need to have an ICD, but we're still protecting those people who need protecting. Uh, following this, they went on to produce a further risk model, which was uh, basically to look at the risk of fatal ventricular arrhythmia and sudden cardiac death. 
And one of the issues was that they felt that the sustained VA model, the first model that they had, probably overestimated that risk. And that was based on the fact that if you take somebody, as we were saying earlier, someone who has a slow VT, are we really going to say that that's akin to sudden cardiac death? It isn't. And so what they did was they went back to the original cohort. Now they didn't have to exclude people who had a VA um, at, the, at the beginning. So the cohort increased to 864 patients. But this time they looked at a different outcome. So they looked at composites of sudden cardiac death, aborted sudden cardiac death, VF, very rapid VTs over 250 beats a minute. And this was interesting. So if you looked at the predictive ability, so of the predictive ability of predicting a, a, a life-threatening ventricular arrhythmia in the future, what they found was that actually the prior presence of a life-threatening VA, unstable VT or previous stable VT did not predict future life-threatening events. But if you looked at the future risk for any form of ventricular arrhythmia, then clearly it was apparent that if you'd had VT in the past or a life-threatening arrhythmia, then it did predict it. But really, it wasn't very good at predicting those people who were going to have life-threatening VAs. So they uh, applied a similar model. They did univariable, multivariable analysis. And then this time, they only had four predictors, males, uh, the age, uh, the extent of uh, the T-wave change and the PVC PERD. And again, uh, when you look at the calibration plot, um, certainly at one year fits really beautifully. Um, if you look at the five year, there's a degree of overestimation, but again, actually looked pretty good. And this time a C statistic was 0.74. So actually the model seemed to work very well. So this was clearly internal validation. So whenever you, you validate it in, you know, internally, you've got to be careful that it's still applicable to other populations and it's important. Uh, that we do that and the literature since these two models has done that and there's a huge number of papers looking at individual cohorts around the world and the predictive ability of this risk, risk calculator. So how does it look? Uh, if you if you log on to arvcrisk.com essentially this is the page that you get uh, and you go through it and you tick your little boxes, you put in the you know, number of T-wave changes on the precordial leads uh, and ultimately as you go through it you get some numbers that pop out the other end so uh, at the top, you have your risk of your fast VTs, VFs, and you get a five year, two year, one year risk. And then you have your risk of your first sustained VA uh, with um, uh, one, two and five years again. One of the issues when we come to uh, validating it is that there's some key issues that weren't really addressed that well. In the in the risk model. We know that from a genotype point of view, there is a significant number of people with PKP2 mutations, which for North America is fine. But if you go to Europe, that's not the case. Uh, desmoglein, desmocolin is significantly higher there. PKP2 is less. And so the question was whether the model would still work in those in those groups. So um, this was uh, a group from uh, London. Again, this was uh, Perry Elliott's uh, group when they took um, a, a significantly you know, well-sized cohort of 550 patients, and they followed them up for, for six years. And um, basically the outcome here again was uh, time to first ventricular arrhythmia. Most of them had had genetic testing done with a pathological variant or likely pathogenic variant in 64%. And the PKP, PKP2 numbers were significantly less here. So the first cohort was 48%, and here they made up 21.3% of cases. And uh, really, in their cohort, even when you looked at the overall gene positive group, actually the predictive model wasn't as strong as it was before. Um, and when you then look at the PKP2 uh, group, it seemed to uh, predict reasonably well. You know, the area under the curve was 0.88, um, but it wasn't as strong as we'd seen in the first uh, in the first studies. And other people have gone on from here and they've applied it to their own uh, their own uh, countries and their own cohorts. And it seems to predict reasonably well, but it's certainly not perfect. And there's still some concern that some forms of genotypes may not be well represented. Exercise has um, always been a challenge. And one of the concerns when the risk calculator was first uh, released People were saying, well, there's no mention of exercise. We know that exercise influences patients. So, you know, why is that not being included? And we know, uh, as I was saying earlier, that it's certainly associated people who do endurance exercise 
are, are certainly those individuals who seem to have an earlier disease onset. They have an increased risk of arrhythmia and they have worse structural disease. So we didn't really understand what the, what's the safe threshold. So when you have a patient who comes to clinic and you're going to talk to them about their you know, their triathlon that they're running in two weeks time, can they do that? You know, how much do they need to reduce exercise? And this has been very challenging for us. The other issue with that comes to, um, you know, what do you say to somebody who has overt disease? What do you say to someone who's a gene carrier? Is there any evidence that if you're a gene carrier and you're running triathlons, are you more likely to, to show disease? And actually you are. Um, but you have to balance that against the benefits of, of healthy living and exercise. So uh, essentially what they did was uh, they took it's a small cohort for sure, because these are 25 athletes who had a diagnosis of ARBC. Uh, they asked them to detrain and they stopped competitive um, uh, sporting activities. And the, the outcome here was to the first sustained VA event after the diagnosis. Um, this was it. You know, if you compared the observed to the predicted based on the model that we saw, actually the predictive model seemed to work pretty well within the, the athlete cohort. Now, there's some issues with it. You know, they made their patients detrain and the outcome of that wasn't really clear um, and whether that was implicated and why the modelling seemed to fit so well. But certainly uh, over the five year follow up period, it did seem to predict. The other interesting aspect was when you looked at the PVC numbers that these individuals had. So as they detrained during the first 18 months, there was a significant drop in PVC burden. It was still high, it was still 1500 uh, over a 24 hour period, but there was a significant reduction. So the original author, so Lauren Bosman was one of the original authors of the risk calculator, uh, and he essentially had a look uh, to see what would happen if they integrated exercise into the risk model calculator. And this brings in this concept of metabolic equivalence. So a meta of one is the amount of energy you consume by doing nothing, just sitting and breathing, going all the way up to you know, various forms of uh, vigorous activity. And they went through a cohort of 176 patients and they did a very detailed exercise interview and they basically tried to calculate the number of metabolic equivalent hours of exercise they did per week. And then they looked at the outcome uh, to sustained uh, ventricular arrhythmia. And it was very interesting. So the American Heart Association recommends as a minimum that adults do 7.5 met hours per week. But what they found was that actually, even if you were doing up to twofold the minimum recommended, actually there was no real change in your uh, survival probability. But once you got up to fourfold and eightfold, that's where we started to see significant changes. So um, when they added the uh, athletic status into the model, it didn't change the C statistic. So they were relatively confident at that stage that probably the model was pretty good in its predictive ability. And they made the, the note that really there wasn't a linear association between increased exercise and disease progression. Um, but certainly in people who were at the high end of exercise, um, then they, they did definitely have an increased risk of ventricular arrhythmia. The last thing I want to talk about was cardiac MRI because the role of MRI in risk stratification for ARVC is not really understood and it's advanced a lot since the 2010 task force criteria as well. In the risk calculator, only RV ejection fraction was included and there's not really anything about tissue characterization uh, of all motion abnormalities, for example. So this was uh, some great work by uh, Aquero who took 140 patients um, with a definite diagnosis of ARVC. And this was really interesting. So when they followed up these patients, they all had baseline MRIs uh, and they followed them. And those people that had a negative MRI at the beginning had no issue at all. None of them had life-threatening arrhythmias. When you saw people who had lone RV going through to biventricular and LV dominant involvement, you see that clearly there's a significant change uh, in outcome and event-free survival. When they compared lone RV involvement to the risk model, there is no significant difference at each of these um, predicted thresholds. But when they looked at LV involvement at every single threshold, statistically, the uh, model seems to underperform uh, the risk. So in conclusion, uh, what I wanted to really bring home was that the diagnosis of ARVC is very difficult to make. But one of the key aspects for us is to try and avoid this knee jerk of giving everybody a device and trying to have a more tailored approach to overall risk stratification. It's also 
you know, in a way, it's important to promote the role of the in-house David Muir Clinic because you need that collective team with the expertise in that area, along with genetics, to see these patients and to manage them and to find a path for them moving forward. There are a lot of grey areas within it, and we will get it wrong. We know that we will not protect every single person. You have to sit with them in clinic and say, there is a risk that despite you seeing us in clinic, that something may happen to one of you, uh, and because we have to balance that risk. And, you know, the, the role of the Inherited Day With Me Clinic in that sense is, is really vital. The risk stratification modelling that we've shown is a great tool. It helps us a little bit more just to understand and to sit with our patients and talk about risk. Um, it's not perfect and definitely the literature, it's only a year ago since the last model came out, there's lots of room for manoeuvre there, but this is a very hot topic at the moment. So further validation is going to be really uh, important. The other thing I wanted to mention uh, just at the end was the Hearts in Rhythm organisation. So this is a national network within Canada led by Andrew Cron in BC, uh, and it brings together all of the in-house arrhythmia physicians, nurses, uh, genetic counsellors across Canada. Uh, and it's a, a fantastic organisation. They have a symposium which is coming to Ottawa next year. So we're in the process of um, organising the symposium. So uh, a flyer will appear later this year with a save the date. Um, but anybody who's uh, interested in coming along, it's a two day uh, conference next June uh, and it would be great to see you there. Thanks so much.